Welcome to the DIY Writer Show with the mild-mannered, slightly heroic host, Jeff Bacon. This is Jeff Bacon with the DIY Writer Podcast. Today I have Eric Herrera with me. Uh, he wrote a book called A Bomb Hunter Story, My Life Clearing the Roads of Iraq. So um, it is a memoir. And uh, I'm guessing we're going to hit some pretty serious subjects. So I'm going to uh, dispatch with the usual uh, shenanigans that I do. And we're going to jump right into it. Eric, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How about you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. You know, um, a nice cold day where I'm at in, in uh, Wisconsin, uh, you know, and, and things are uh, things are lovely here. So <laughs> let's jump right into your book. This is a memoir of, uh, of clearing roads in Iraq. Yes. Um, I've been, I served in the U S military from 2005 to 2010. Okay. And when I did leave, um, as any other soldier, I did have struggles with being in the military, things like that. So for about 10 years, I never really talked about it. It might be here and there. I talked about little things, this and that, um, it wasn't until maybe last year I kind of had my final mental breakdown and I decided that I wanted to do videos on the things that I did in the military, but it just never seemed like that was going to get my point out there. Mm -hmm. And me, I never thought of being a writer. And one day I just decided I'm going to write it all down. And the more and more I wrote, the better and better I felt just getting all the things off my chest, what I did, what I've seen things like that. It just really helped me therapeutically. And at the end, that was kind of like my goal, just to feel better about what I did and being able to express how I felt and things like that. So this, uh, this book, which you, uh, you released it in July of 2020. And it's, it, it, I assume that it deals with, uh, um, the PTSD and the, the emotions of, of you know, being where you were and what you had to do. Yeah. Man, my job was a combat engineer. Um, at the time when I joined in 2005, the description was kind of vague. It was mainly the description of what combat engineers used to do in world war two and Vietnam. Uh, the description was clearing minefields and building fortifications. Mm -hmm. Well, technically, there are still minefields in the Middle East and things like that. But the main threat in Iraq and Afghanistan were IEDs. Right. So the military had to adapt to that. And that's what became our job uh, toward the beginning of the Iraq war. Um, when I went in, when I first went in, Iraq from 06 to 07, that was kind of the height of the Iraq war. So IEDs were a big thing that was going on. Um, that's when Bush had his surge, yeah. 20,000 troops, something like that. Um, I was there during that time and we were busier than ever. Um, we were finding IEDs almost every other day. Uh, and we would go, three different platoons would go out each day and some of us, all three of us would find something. So, I mean, it was a bit, bit pretty busy job. Can, I mean, can you describe that process? I mean, I mean, how would you, I mean, was it just simple metal detectors and going out and find them that way or how, how did you detect them? Um, no, we uh, rolled between four and five vehicles in a convoy. Um, at the time there was new vehicles coming out, we would drive in something that's called an RG31. It was a South, uh, South African vehicle that was used to um, deter landmines for diplomats. Um, we would have that. Uh, another, another one of our special vehicles is called the Buffalo. I actually have a small uh, model of it. Um, so this is a, very large vehicle and the whole point of this is has this huge arm hydraulic arm on the top of it so anytime we would ever find something that looks suspicious we would use this arm to move things around uh 
pull, dig things, something like that. And um, nine not times out of 10, the thing that's suspicious ends up being an IED. But the thing was, is that in Iraq, there's trash everywhere. So yeah. little, little mini landfills in the median of the road, um, you could hide anything in there. So what our process was, was we would go five miles an hour down the road, looking out the window and doing this every day, you start memorizing trash. You memorize trash piles, things like that. So you would notice if something was out of place. Mm. Um, and we would do this between eight to 12 hours a day, depending on what we found and things like that. Sometimes when we would find something, we would sit on it for maybe two hours waiting for um, EOD, a disposable unit, to come out and get rid of it. So it depends on <laughs> what, what we found those days, how long we'd be out there. Yeah. Um, so I... Yeah, I, 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 here's my... my um, yeah, I say I have so many questions on it, but it's, it's, it's not really about that but let's get into your book what does your book cover um, my book covers how i ended up joining the military um, i was end up stationed in germany for three years so i talk about my time there mm -hmm. um, dealing with being away from home um, how other soldiers deal with that too i go over both of my deployments in baghdad and also a town called hilla um, and i tell different stories of good times and bad times, things like that. Incidences that we've had uh, where we've lost men. Um, that's another reason why I did write my book was because a lot of the stories that happened during those incidences never really came out. Um, people were telling small little lies or little fib bits, things like that. For me being there, I wanted to tell the truth on what actually happened. Um, it felt better for me. It also felt better for the families that did lose loved ones to know the truth. Yeah. Um, I found out years later that some of them really didn't know what happened. They just get little stories here and there. And this was something I was trying to get them to have closure on it. So if we can back up just a little bit, why did you join the army? What was your... Um, yeah, so I graduated high school. I ended up going to Northern Illinois University. Um, I was more interested in the parties and the mm -hmm. festivities and things like that. Never really went to class, so I ended up getting kicked out of college. Okay. Um, I was living with my mother at the time, and uh, her rules that she developed, I really didn't want to live by them. So I decided that I would join the military. Um, I have had uncles in the military. I had some friends that joined as well. So I got as much information as I could and uh, just made my decision from there. I just, it was time for me to uh, change my life and get my life together. Okay. And so then uh, you uh, went through boot camp. Yeah. What was that like? Um, it was different. Uh, at the time, I was really overweight. Uh, I was actually maybe about 270 pounds. And for me being 6'3 and 19 years old, my, the weight I had to be at was at 180. So mm -hmm. I had to lose a large amount of weight. Um, it was a struggle for me, being the big guy and the tall guy. Mm -hmm. um, drill sergeants on me all the time but I was kind of used to it because I played sports all my life so I'm used to having a coach up my ass and things like that so yeah it really didn't phase me as much so 6'3 were you a wrestler no I was a basketball player oh sorry about that just kidding <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I I, we, joke with, we joke with the wrestlers all the time too so yeah, yeah. I get it <laughs> Yeah, I'm about uh, two inches shorter than you are. So, but I was a wrestler. <laughs> it's because I uh, I couldn't uh, I couldn't hit the broad side of anything with a basketball. You know, <clears throat> just I, I sucked so bad. It was the only other thing I could do, I guess. I don't know, but 
starting in second grade. But mm-hmm. regardless, <clears throat> so you get through boot camp, and uh, and how how did you end up in the uh, engineering section? Um, like I said before, I saw the description. It seemed interesting to me. Um, it was a combat MOS, so at the time it was strictly just males. So any combat MOS when I was joining is only males. So I think it's combat engineers, infantry, and field artillery, I believe was the other one. It was all males. So um, also I learned that we would be dealing with explosives too as well. So I wasn't really a pyromaniac as a kid, but it seemed interesting to me. Um, and that's one of the things we did learn in basic training was how to build charges because another one of our jobs as combat engineers were also called breachers. So when you see like saving private Ryan, when they're storming the beaches of Normandy, mm-hmm. when they're going through all those obstacles, those are engineers blasting those obstacles out of the way. Ah, okay. So things like that. Um, so in Germany, we dealt with Bangalore's different, different charges like that, breaching doors, walls, things like that. And it was a fun job. Um, Unfortunately, we weren't able to do that during my time in uh, Iraq because we were needed elsewhere, uh, clearing roadside bombs. <clears throat> so, so you get uh, shipped to Iraq during the uh, during uh, that war, um, and I I actually grew up uh, during the first one, which lasted like what five days, I think, or something like that. The uh, uh, in into Kuwait, and a lot of my friends went into Kuwait. Um, and then I was quite a much, uh, quite a bit older when, uh, you know, 10 years makes a difference, but, uh, when, uh, the second Iraq war happened, the, uh, um, you're over there and, and you start searching for IEDs and, you know, your, your days are long, eight, 10, 12 hours um dealing with this and i assume that uh um you know your unit that you're with i mean you get very close especially when you're you know spending eight ten hours in in a truck with somebody you know how i mean how was that was that i mean can you describe that those relationships that you built um lasting relationships um guys that i served with during that time one of them ended up being best man at my wedding a couple of my groomsmen Mm -hmm. i still talk to them today it's a it's a more than brothers it's a thing where you could talk to them about anything because you've been through the worst things possible with each other Um, there's really nothing holding back when i speak with those guys and that's one of the great things about the military is that camaraderie Mm-hmm. Um, being yeah in those missions eight to 12 hours you learn about guys about their lives what they did before and it, it really helps uh, when you really need them in other situations they're always there to have your back so how hard is it for you to talk to a blockhead like me who doesn't really know anything uh, that's one of the reasons why i like to go on these type of things a lot of people don't know our job um and i like to educate different people on it um when i would come back from r and r come back to the states things like that i would turn on the news and you know, during the iraq war i would hear things what the news would say but the things that they would talk about was maybe five years old <laughs> things oh, that really? I knew five years ago um especially the different type of ieds that were coming out um i it seems like the times are just way off and things like that. Um, so I like to educate people on actually what was actually happening and the things that were going on. Cause it seems like people only get half truths and that's not right. Well, and I always assume that, you know, you, you kind of know that that goes on, but I assume that that's for some sort of a security reason, or is it just because, you know, they get what their, you know, the military releases something and, and that's what they pick up on? Or, I mean, why why, why the disparagement in the uh, information? Um, I would understand, yeah, the secrecy some of the equipment is, especially some of the things that we do use um, that they wouldn't want the enemy to know. 
Um, but some things are can be told. Um, I mean, sometimes you hear about it now with uh, different bombings here that are happening in the States and in other countries and things like that. Um, they don't really say what what the device actually is, but when you go in there, they know. They know what was used, um, how it was detonated, things like that. Um, I think... I think, yeah, I think it's more of a safety reason so other people don't try to do it as well. Okay. Um, it's the same thing like because uh, uh, was it uh, Timothy McVeigh, the, the Unabomber? Yeah. He, he was actually a combat engineer too. He was a sapper. So at sapper school, that's where the high combat engineers are. And his name is actually up on the wall at sapper school. Okay. So, I mean, after that happened, um, there was a lot of security reasons. Even when I went in, I had to get background checks because of it. So yeah, it, it, there's security within involved in it. So yeah. Just, uh, you know, the question that pops up into my mind, um, you know, if you don't mind getting into it. Um, so a bomb detonates and you said they can, they know exactly, you know, what it was, how it was detonated and everything else. I mean, how do they know that? Is it just a, a forensic type, uh, analysis of the blast or how does that how does that work uh yeah so a lot of the times we would have ieds blow up on us and a lot of times the trigger mechanism would survive it um also depending on the blast hole um different types of cords things like that things that are just lying around embedded in the thing so yeah it, it is a forensics thing but with us, I mean, we're not really qualified on it, but we've seen it so much that we could actually tell right away what it was and how it was made. So I assume that they blow up when uh, you're scooping it with that uh, that hydraulic arm or, uh, I mean, yeah, so they, they um, blow up on you all the time. That, that, uh, that seems like an interesting job. <laughs> yeah. Um, the ingenuity how these IEDs were made is unreal. Um, we would find uh, IEDs in plastic bags. We would find IEDs in curbs. Like they literally cut the curb out and mold the IED back into the curb to make it look like it never was moved. Um, we would really? find we would find uh, <clears throat> detonation devices would be cell phones, beepers car or garage door openers key fobs things like that mm -hmm. um, even christmas lights for pressure wires uh infrared um, devices so i mean the, it's amazing how these things are built and for us we always had to adapt and that was kind of like the hard thing to do trying to adapt on the fly so uh the remote detonation that means they're watching you as you're excavating and, and trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to, you know, uncover the IED so it can be dismantled. Yeah. About seven times out of 10. Yeah. It would be someone manning the detonation device. That that's uh that sucks. Yeah. So, I mean, I assume that you stayed in the vehicle the whole time and, or did you have to get out and, and uh, manually uncover it? Um, it depends um, after if it did detonate on us. I mean, we would look around to make sure there's not a second one. Um, usually that happens a lot. So guys would get out of the vehicle and there'd be a secondary device and then they would explode and get more soldiers. Um, but yeah, nine times out of 10, we would stay in the vehicles. Me being a big guy, I was always the gunners of the vehicle. So I'm mm -hmm. half sticking out of the vehicle and that's another thing I would have to watch out if anything ever happened to me that I'm not sticking out or I'm getting shrapnel or things like that. Holy Sometimes shit. it does so happen. So you're, you're, you're sitting out of the turret or yeah. whatever you call it, uh, yep. man and the gun, and then something freaking blows up. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Okay. Uh, we, we've had a few guys, um, the gunners did seriously get hurt and yeah. um things like that so i mean it does happen you always have to watch out yeah so how many uh you know 
don't know. I'm, I, I'm just sitting here. I've got so many questions that are, that are so damn dumb that it's not even funny, but I mean, you know, obviously highly dangerous job, you know, very brave for doing it. Um, how many, how many people did you lose? Um, I've lost four brothers. Um, unfortunately, one of the incidents actually happened on Christmas day of 06. And that's uh, one of the big parts of my book. Um, lost another brother three months later to the day. Uh, and I explained all that in there because a lot of the times um, things aren't things aren't said to the fullest extent. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote it because I want people to know what actually happened, what ended up happening to us. Um, one of the main things that happened that night is we were actually left out there. No one actually came to our help for hours. And we've lost uh, three guys. I think the only, the only people that actually came and helped us was the evac unit that came out. Um, okay. And the, I talk about how we shouldn't have been out there that day but we we're forced to and things like that. So yeah, it's uh, one of the, oops, one of the things I struggled with for the last 10 years was that day. Um, constantly going over in my mind that day and everything like that. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. Cause now I'm more at peace that what I've done and what happened. So from, from an outsider's perspective, you know, what you're describing, what you went through and what you did. Um, you know, I, I, you know, in, I envision a hero, you know, I envision somebody that, uh, you know, very brave going out there and doing a job that, uh, you know, not many people would really do, you know, <clears throat> is that how you feel? Or, I mean, how do you feel inside about that? I mean, it's, you know, I mean, from my perspective, you're a hero. And, you know, way braver than I would ever be, you know, as far as, as far as I can tell. Um, but, you know, in order to deal with the stuff that you did, I mean, you must not feel that way. Um, a lot of us in my unit, we don't feel ourselves as heroes. Um, during our time there, we did get recognized by a lot of people. Um, NPR came out and did a couple of interviews with us. Um, we've had officers from other countries come out with us on mission because they were hearing what we were doing. Uh, we even got recognized by General Schumacher when he came out. He was a chief of staff at the time. Yeah. Um, but with us, is we find we define hero as a different way. One of the main things was after um, the, dis the Christmas incident, things like that, we had to adapt. Um, mass, mass casualties was becoming a problem. So we didn't really have enough guys to take care of everyone. So we actually had these one-man vehicles that were actually called Huskies. And what we ended up doing was putting these Huskies in the front of the convoy. So it's a one-guy, one-man vehicle, and he would be the lead, the lead guy, and he'd be looking at the side of the road. Uh, the unfortunate thing about it is it's bait. It's really a bait car. So how we find define heroes is the guys that would go in that vehicle. I've gone in it a couple of times and a number of other of us have done it too. Um, it might sound like a crazy thing to volunteer for, but we all volunteered for it. Um, it was just something that, that camaraderie, you know, it was like, I rather have it blow up on me than everyone else. That's no. what we define as heroes. Those guys that did that a lot. So you stuck yourself in this, in the single person car and drove forward, mm -hmm. um, or ahead of everybody else. And you're basically, you're basically a, a target. You're basically bait. Mm -hmm. No kidding. It, it just, it seems to me like, uh, you know, with all the technology that we, we have in, in this century that they'd have a better way of doing things other than, you know, sticking somebody's ass out in front and saying, okay, you're bait today. Well, yeah, it is, does sound kind of crazy, but we would have, we have uh, devices on the front of our vehicles, things like that, that um, 
prevent casualties. I can't go into that because they're, they're, yeah, no, they no, are kind of right. secret. But yeah, there are devices out there that helped us um, prevent these mass casualties that uh, would help us. So I mean, that's all I could say really about that. <laughs> yeah, and I, 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 I wouldn't want you to compromise anything. I just, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> technology aside, putting somebody in a bait car just seems like Jesus Christ. Christ. Okay, because you know somebody's sitting up there in a hill or something like that, going, "Oh, there he is." <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. So uh, those guys are heroes. Yes. I uh, again, you know, I, I I look at that and go, "That's just batshit crazy." Okay, cool. No, we we all realize that we're we're a little bit nuts, but um, that was something we had to do, and. Um, we did enjoy it and didn't enjoy it. It's a love hate thing. And I can, I, I can kind of get that. Um, the, the one aspect of your book that you uh, have in your book blurb is you talk about uh, narcissistic leaders and, and politics and everything else. Can you, can you tell how that, can you divulge on how, uh, how that affected your missions? Um, one of the reasons was Christmas night. Okay. Uh, and, um, also during our first deployment, um, I heard a lot through the grapevine that we weren't supposed to be there. Our unit wasn't supposed to be there. It was kind of leadership, really high leadership wanting to be pushed through the ranks of higher officer ranks, things like that, just because their unit went, uh, on a deployment, things like that. So yeah, I do talk about that in my book. So they did it purely for self-advancement? Yeah. Shit. Yeah, as, as bad as it sounds, yeah. Can I just say fuckers? <clears throat> oh yeah, you can't say that. I can't say that, no. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Okay. So you got those political people in the army too, who just only care about themselves and are trying to make a, a, a career out of it by, you know, basically sacrificing anybody else who happens to be under them or in their way. Huh? Oh yeah. There's, there's, there's tons of ways, um, especially higher officers. Um, they could be at a, they could be at a desk job at the Pentagon or something like that. And then they take a trip to either Afghanistan or Iraq they stay there for a couple of days and then they could put it on their resume that they deployed. So it's kind of like a <laughs> it's little loopholes, things like that. No shit. Yeah. <laughs> a seven day vacation. I'm sure they weren't uh, in the uh, thick of things and then oh, they, no, could, say they could deploy. Yeah. They deployed. Sweet. That, that kind of makes me half ass sick. Yeah. Things like that is just, and especially with like awards too seen that happen a lot like awards that are kind of like bullshit <laughs> like so it's just just to promote or it's not to promote it's just to bump up your resume and things like that for other things another guy that i uh that i actually listened to um he when he said this i'm like seriously um he said that 70 percent of 70 or 80 percent of the uh, combat awards go to people that were never in combat of course it's like, yep. seriously, you know, and no, my, uh, all the officer, my first deployment, all the officers that were working desk jobs ended up getting bronze stars and bronze stars is something like to do for valor and things like that. It has to be, um, something really extraordinary. Uh, they ended up getting all the, the desk jockeys, bronze stars for the deployment. So that, that was kind of a kick in the nuts because there was a lot of guys, out there that were busting their ass for different things and barely got any awards. I mean, we really don't do it for the awards and things oh, like that. We do it for that, but of course. it's still kind of like a, a shitty thing. But. Yeah. I just, I, that I don't understand. I, you know, I, I kind of come from the mentality that, you know, you have to do something to get something. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah sitting at, sitting at a desk, uh, writing reports and, drawn out maps uh, doesn't really seem <laughs> award worthy, but Hey, it happens. 
Well, I mean, they have participation awards that they could probably give out, but I mean, that, that shouldn't be a bronze star, I wouldn't think. Uh, oh, yeah, that, that's one of the reasons why I got out of the military, too. Um, starting to become too participation trophy-ish. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I've heard other people talk about that kind of stuff, but, uh, you know, again, it just, you, you kind of look at it and it's like, don't you do that? I mean, you're kind of devaluing what that award's actually supposed to mean by giving it out to yeah, just, you know, whoever happens to be on the docket or my best friend or, you know, whatever, <laughs> even if they don't do anything. Uh, especially, um, so on a soldier's uniform, uh, they would have, um, the, on one patch would be the unit that they're a part of. And then on the other side would be their combat patch. So that patch would be the unit that they deployed with. So after my first deployment, I was part of the first infantry division. So I wore my big red one as my combat patch. Mm -hmm. Um, what was happening was new soldiers that were coming in that didn't have a combat patch were complaining. Um, we had a different patch than them. And so our leadership ended up taking our old patches off and putting on the patch that everyone else had. So uh, things like, so when Serious? that would happen, yeah. So a lot of what would happen was a lot of the soldiers that were previously deployed wouldn't even wear their combat patch out of protest of it. And it did get kind of heated there. And that's another reason why I kind of left because it was just getting, why um, would, yeah. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know the the big red one. I mean, that's historical. I yeah. mean, that has a ton of military history behind it. That I mean, that's one of the greatest prides I have is of being able to serve under the big red one. I, I mean, I mean, there have been massive amounts of movies made on that. I mean, yep. Just, I mean, you know, and and I know that sounds stupid, but it's like you know that has some serious military history behind it. And they're fucking and, with it like that. Yeah, I mean, I I would love, I would love to see higher ups, you know, have a different combat patch because I know that they've been through it. So I pick their brains on certain things like that. But having everyone having the same patch kind of defeats the purpose of it all. It's kind of like a, yeah, a bunch of crybabies, you know. Like he's got something different than I got, so it just, it just became a joke toward the end. That. <laughs> That's actually kind of disheartening. I mean, it really is. I mean, that that particular, uh, <clears throat> especially that, I mean, that is that is a historical unit that has done amazing fucking things mm -hmm. that they would just, I mean, it's almost, it, it's almost like a, a disrespect type thing, you know. I, I tell that story a lot to soldiers that have been in the States. And over the years, I've learned being stationed in the States and being stationed in Germany, it is completely different. It's a whole different type of world. Um, units in the States, there might be like 60,000 60, soldiers on one base. Um, in Germany, on uh, the bases that I was, there was only a total of maybe 5,000 troops. So there's, the lifestyle is kind of really different, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just kind of kind of a pro in my part i'm glad i was in germany i hear stories here in the states that are just um terrible i mean you hear the stories that happened in fort hood i mean i yeah. i i was even told that i was going to uh go to fort hood i decided to re-enlist in germany because i was definitely not going there and that was before all the <laughs> other bad things that were happening even before the fort hood shooting and things like that so i mean it's it's a different culture, but I think being out there, they're kind of trying to make their own rules and there was really no one around to tell them otherwise. So it was kind of disheartening. Yeah. Um, and we won't get into the Fort Hood thing, but that was, yeah. that was, you know, from, from a civilian's perspective, that was crazy. And um, there's been 10, 20 different other things that have happened there too so yeah <laughs> so, well, and, and that i don't know about i just remember the shooting and yeah. some of the things that came out afterwards and uh, maybe that's what you're alluding to maybe not mm -hmm. but it uh, um it's crazy when i my sister was a marine her i'm sorry my sister is a marine <clears throat> um 
and she's them for three or four years and and so is her husband and uh, some of the things that they talk about in uh, being in North Carolina was uh, you know kind of interesting I mean they're on base they never had to deploy or anything like that they're they're a little uh, behind that but uh, um, when the war broke out they're still in the reserves and so they they you know had a possibility of having to deploy but they didn't um, <clears throat> if I remember correctly but uh, you know some of the stories that uh, that uh, I've heard from uh, from them are kind of interesting at times you know just base life and stuff like that but uh, fort hood kind of blew my mind but uh, so you get out of the army and now you have to deal with all of this shit i mean and that's that's what i mean you you have to sit down and deal with it what was you know what what happened i mean um i was i was kind of done i wanted to move on with my life things like that um I ended up coming back home and, you know, I, I did struggle a little bit. Every soldier does. Um, that's why you have a lot of soldiers. They end up going back in. Um, but what they really don't miss is the military and things like that. They miss the camaraderie. They don't, they don't have their brothers and sisters down the hall next door to them where they could just go talk to them. Um, most of these guys and women are on their own. And that's a lot of the times that's what they miss. Um, I was fortunate at the time, a lot of um, my friends were getting out of the military and that's when what uh, Skype was starting to come big at that time. The iPhone was starting to come out big. Sure. I mean, I jo when I joined the military, uh, Twitter and um, YouTube weren't even invented yet. So it was kind of hard to communicate with people and things like that. Um, I think the only thing that at the time was like MySpace and Facebook, but that was before Facebook even like had their messenger things right. and stuff like that. So, I mean, technology now has gotten a lot better where I could actually FaceTime my friends and talk to them and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, but when I got out, I, I really had no resources. That's one of the things that's really uh, bad because you'll turn on the TV and you might see, the commercial to join the military, things like that. But you don't see any commercials about resources to help soldiers with PTSD and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually live next door. Uh, I actually live 10 blocks away from a, um, a veteran resource center for five years. And I didn't even know about it. Oh, I wow. have one when I went to, I went back to college and got my degree in business administration. I stumbled across the table, which was a veteran resource uh, lady. And she told me that I had this resource center 10 blocks away from me and I had no idea. Mm. Um, so I decided to actually go. <clears throat> um, I tried, I actually started to try to talk about it, but I wasn't ready. I would feel nauseous after speaking with them and things like that. And at the, yeah, so I wasn't ready. So I told them, you know, I'll be back. Um, another five years later, that's when I ended up writing my book. And I realized that writing this is also helping other people. I uh, have friends that say they have a soldier that's dealing with kind of like the same thing. What can they do? Things like that. I'm like, well, they just have, it's tough, but you have to find these resources yourself, um, which is really upsetting. Um, but I encourage other soldiers to tell your story. All of us have a story to tell. Um, get it out there. You'll feel a hell of a lot better um, expressing it and things like that. Hmm. So what, what was the process that you had to, I mean, what made you ready to share this? I mean, what, um, I mean, I mean, it had to be something. I mean, you couldn't just sit down and talk about it because it made you nauseous. So something had to flip to make it okay. Now it's now it's time to talk, or now it's it, it it's okay for me. So yeah, last year was the thirteenth anniversary of what happened on Christmas Day for us, and a lot of a lot of the soldiers that were there that day um, started to crack about what happened. I think I think the emotion started to come out of everybody, and. Uh, things were said that weren't right. Um, 
things that were said to certain people that weren't right as well. So I wanted to tell the right story since I was there for all those times. And it's the only right thing to do. I mean, don't half ass it or tell half truths about it. That was one of the things that really got me going. That's when I wanted to start right, uh, doing the videos. But I think um, having it on paper gives it a more lasting impression. So um, just a, a side note, you have a, you have a YouTube channel where you talk about this or what do you? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, so when you talk about videos, you're talking about like podcasts and stuff like that? No, I was making my own videos and my plan was to put them on my Facebook, things like that. Okay. But I, I really wasn't uh, too savvy on all that. So that's when I decided, yeah, I'm, I'm going to write it. You're going to write it. Okay. So there are people out there that don't know how um, their relatives died. I mean, they get, you're talking about how they got kind of half truths or whatever. And you come out with the truth um, as far as, as far as exactly what happened. Um, it, can you get in trouble for that? Or is it so far gone now that it's, it, it's okay to disclose everything? Um, I'm, I'm no longer affiliated with the military. If they want to come after me, what are you going to do? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, what, I mean, I mean, I'm not the one that lied. So you have more explaining to do than I do. I'm not going to bullshit anybody. So have you talked to anybody and, and told them exactly what happened um, for somebody who has a loss? And, you know, what was, I mean, were they relieved to find out what happened or were they just extremely pissed off? Um, I have visited um, all the families that, um, the brothers that I've lost, I've actually gone and visited them, talked to them, things like that. But at the time, um, I was, wasn't telling them the whole story because I did not, I did not know what was in the reports of what happened that night. Okay. Um, we actually had to give eyewitness statements to what happened that night. And I actually found out that the family members weren't even given some of those uh, statements. They were just given a piece of paper saying um, what was the cause of death and that was it. So um, that made me really really angry and that's when i'm like yeah i gotta put it down on paper um to say what actually happened wow <clears throat> i i can't imagine i really can't especially losing somebody like that and then you know finding out later that you know it was because of you know as you would say, some narcissistic personalities or some uh, some very uh, uh, self-centered people trying to uh, you know make a point or make a make a make a career move or whatever, and that's you know that uh, that would just make me uh, sick and pissed all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Is what uh, the only feelings I can really portray. Yeah, the, um, one of the things that really made me upset as I was actually writing this book one of those leaders passed away from cancer, I believed. So that was kind of like a <laughs> uh, can't answer for your decisions type of thing. Yeah. Well, I, according to my beliefs, he's probably answering for it now. Yeah, hopefully, you know, but uh, wow. So, you know, is there a happy ending for Eric? I mean, is this, is this, I mean, are things looking up for you as far as your personal development and, and, you know, how you're dealing with, I mean, you wrote this book and it, it seems like you're on a, on a good road now. I mean, it's yeah. gotta be hard on a daily basis. I get that, but you know, is it, is it looking up for you, man? Um, yeah, it's been, uh, toward the end of my book, I talk about the meltdown that I finally had and it's been over a year. And in the last year I've, done a lot of healing i'm not completely healed but um, there's still little things that i still have struggles with and things like that i talk about it in the book um but overall my my mind is at peace um 
I'm happier now. I'm more engaging with people. Um, I'm not afraid to talk about what I've been through and what I did. Um, it's uh, still healing. And if I could help people heal too as well, that makes me feel even better. So if you're going to give one piece of advice to somebody coming out of the military and, and starting, you know, where you were in 2010, I mean, what would it be? I mean, what would, what would you tell them, you know, because I assume that it, you know, in retrospect, you know, I should have done this or I should have done that. or You know, maybe I should have, I mean, how, how can these guys find help and, and what, should, what should they be pursuing in order to uh, get a little bit of self-healing? Uh, one thing is to have a plan for when you get out. Um, the worst thing you could do is get out and have nothing, nothing at all planned out or what you want to do or where you're going to go. That's when things kind of get bad. Um, that's a lot of the times that's what happens is they don't have a plan and then they either go back in or one of the big things is drugs and alcohol. That's another big thing. Yeah. Um, but have, have a plan. Um, when I, when I left, I was planning on joining the Chicago police department. I took the test and everything like that while I was still in, um, I ended up did not doing that. I ended up going back to, uh, some odd jobs and then going back to college. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, even now, uh, when you're in, you have that, that option uh, to go. I mean, the military paid for my entire college education. So, I mean, there's that too. Go back to school and find out what you want to do. Have that plan. That's the best thing you could do. And, you know, you said there's not a whole lot of advertisement for the resources that are available to uh, um, people that get out of the military. I mean, how do they find you happen you happened to cross a table that had uh, you know a, a resource center that was ten blocks from your house. I mean, how can people you know find those resources of just doing a Google search or you know? yeah you you can do a Google search and they do pop up. Um, i'm i've I've actually never been to a VA hospital before because I hear horror stories. My uncles have told me horror stories. They were Vietnam vets. They told me horror stories about the VA and I never really wanted to go down that road. Yeah. But yeah, with the technology now, yeah, Google searches, I mean, you could find these things. I mean, it's kind of sad that they don't promote these things, but I mean, you, you have to help yourself. I mean, I learned that kind of the hard way I had to help myself. Well, you know, one of the things that's been in the news, um, you know, at least in the past five years where I'm at, I'm, I'm in Wisconsin is some of the horror stories from the VA hospitals up here and, and what, you know, just, just the misadministration of it, you know, oh, yeah. and, and some of the, uh, you know, stupid shit that they do. It's just like, you gotta be kidding me. These guys fought for us and now you're just going to piss on them, you know? Um, yeah, my, uh, my uncle, he, uh, he ended up having some kind of tumor and they, they told him come back in six months for your doctor's appointment. Well, it got worse. And, he ended up going to his own private doctor and luckily he had it taken care of because it would have been a really bad problem. He would have been dead before his VA appointment. Wow. So it's kind of you know, horror stories like that. You wonder, yeah, I, I always, when I hear stories like that, I just wonder how do, how do these people grow to not give a shit about anything? You know, I mean, the people in there, they get so jaded and so just, okay, well just do this, you know, or whatever. I mean, I, I don't understand that system. I don't, I also do not understand how somebody with a soul could fucking do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, you know, and that's me getting up on a soapbox and being pissed off, but you know, there's plenty of things to do that about, but yeah, obviously I'm not in your situation, but uh, that just kind of ticks me off. Um, what's the best resource that you found that helped you get through um, your, your trauma? Actually, talking to my fellow brothers in arms, um, I it was surprising how much uh, they were there for me and were able to want to talk and things like that because they might they had the same problems too. They did not know where to go either. So just by us talking, uh, really helped. I mean, that's that's the number one thing that helps. I mean, 
Right? You're not alone in the whole thing, even though you might feel you are, but you're never alone. The one thing that that shocks me a little bit is that, you know, when you get out of the military, that there isn't somebody, you know, like, here's a packet of information, here's where you can go, or here's the resources available to you, or, you know, whatever. It, it, it seems like, uh, okay, you're done, see ya. You know, and it, it's kind of just the end. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like there's a whole lot of uh, uh, guidance after you get out. Um, I did have some people that were telling me, so one of the main things was I got actually a complete physical when I left the military. So, so I had records of like anything that, um, anything physical that was caused by the military, things like that. Yeah. They give you a packet, things like that. Um, for, I actually ended up getting out in 2013 because I was in, in active reserve for three years. So I had to report once a year to a base showing I'm alive, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, and they, they give you these little packets and things like that, but there's nothing, no one really there to, you know, tell you anything. Um, there's uh, the, the only thing that happened, I think maybe the last three months, um, before I actually got my discharge, I would get phone calls, emails, people would show up at my door. Hey, do you want to reenlist? <laughs> um, really? I'm like, I'm like, no, I don't know. I don't want to reenlist. Um, I have recruiters come to my door. Hey, you want, you want to talk about the military? I'm like, no, nah, I really don't want to. And then that last day, uh, that's when everything stopped. The phone calls, the emails, the people coming to my door stopped. So I mean, it's kind of like, uh, all right, we all, we all are trying to get you back, but we can't do anything anymore after that. So they they kind of play upon the uh, um what you'd said about uh, you know there's a lot of people who just go back into the military because they they can't adjust and they don't have a plan. One of the main problems is is that soldiers get stay in the military for so long that they actually become dependent on the military so an example is um maybe your wife or your child um has some kind of condition um i had one soldier his wife had lupus he couldn't get out of the military because the military was paying for her medications and therapies and things like that yeah. So he, it's like things like that. Um, child support is like another big thing to uh, guys stay in because uh, they got to pay their child support. I mean, they're, they, they don't have a plan to get out and find a job. So they stay in because that's um, a set thing. Sure. So it, it, that's really one of the hard things. That's why I left because I left because I, uh, I wasn't dependent on the military yet. I didn't want that to happen to me. Yeah. So today, how are you doing? Um, I'm great today. Um, I can't complain and a uh, lot healthier mentally. Um, I actually used to have nightmares all the time of different things that I went through. I actually haven't had a nightmare in over a year. So, I mean, just my mind is clear now. Good. Um, I guess my last question for you is, there, is there anything that people like me can do to help um, vets? Yeah, there are um, a lot of the big things vets really like, especially when they're um, deployed as care packages. Care packages are like a really big thing. Um, there's different organizations out there that uh, you could send stuff to and um, they will send these care packages to different units. I know the, I live in a, in a small suburb of Chicago and our, our suburb uh, got a hold of an organization and people donated deodorant, toothpaste, toothbrushes, um, bed sheets, things like that and uh, to send over to, to troops. Um, if the, the small things like that go a long way. They bring a, a lot of smiles to soldiers' faces. Okay. 
So what about uh, after you get out? Is there any organizations that, uh, that you know you can contribute to or anything anybody could do, or is that all pretty much um, the resource centers and, and uh, you guys relying on each other as vets? Um, not quite sure I understand that one. No. Um, is there, you know, for people getting out of the military, is there anything that uh, that you wish that uh, normal citizens would do? Would do? Um, Maybe it's a tough question. I don't know. I just yeah, I really can. I really can't answer that one. <laughs> that's fine. I mean, and that's fine. I mean, you know, my my thing would be, uh, you know, if if anybody's drawn to it, write a letter to a, a congressman or a senator or whatever about the uh, shitty way that the VA is being ran. And maybe sometime, sometime in the future, maybe that would be fixed. And if there's any uh, contributions that can be made or, or even volunteering for uh, resource centers or anything like that, I think that would, that might help um, some things. I mean, I, I think the awareness of what the vets go through, especially after they've served the country, um, in the ways that they're asked to in, in these wars, I think is, uh, you know, something that needs to be noted. And I think it's something that needs to be taken care of by the people that you're actually protecting, you know, and I think that as a, uh, a population in the United States, I think we need to treat the military and the people that get out of the military in a much better fashion than we have in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's organizations like uh, wounded warriors. Yeah. Um, they put on events for different people, uh, things like that. I'm, I've never been to one of their events. Um, my uncle that I talked about, he recently passed away. My cousin put on a charity softball tournament for them and wounded warriors came out uh, um, to help out and things like that. So I tell you the other things that I like is like uh, black rifle coffee or yeah. ranger up the, all those goofy ass t-shirts that they do or whatever. I mean, those are vet owned companies that support vets you know i mean even if it's just buying products from from uh, vet owned companies that support vets you know that's a way to support people too i mean those those are just two companies i like but uh, you know there's there's a bunch more out there there's there's ones that focus on traumatic brain injuries and all sorts of things that are uh, um you know great businesses that support vets you know it, you know the vets that Vets supporting vets. I think that's a, that's a great thing too, but uh, yeah, they're, they're out there now. A lot of the vets are getting into the trades. I know in my area, there's plumbers that are plumbers, HVACs, and they're all veteran owned. Um, yep. I mean, you help, help them out that way. Yep. And I can tell you from personal experience, if you're looking at hiring somebody and it's a vet versus somebody who's never served, <laughs> the vet will do a much better job just because they know, they know how to work. That's another, another sad thing. Cause I used to go to um, these vet conventions. So it was businesses that were hiring vets and there would be maybe, Jesus, maybe like three to 500 of us in a room. And a lot of the times it seems like there were dog and pony shows really. Mm -hmm. Cause um I, I never got a call from a, a single one of those businesses that I talked to. I talked to a lot of the guys that actually went with me and different things. They never got a call either. So after maybe like two of those conventions I went to, I just figured it was a dog and pony show about the whole thing. So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of sad that that actually happened. Here's the one thing I've noticed, and uh, I'm an IT guy. And when you hire a vet and you've got that snooty little shit whose computer doesn't work and they're bitching up a storm and they're like, yeah, man, yeah, man, man, man. you send the vet in there, they can actually sit there and do their job and not listen to what's going on in the background and not react because that was the worst oh, yeah. thing that would ever happen was, you know, some, um, uh, uh, let, let's just say a younger person who can't keep their mouth shut 
would get me in trouble because they'd say something snotty back to the person like i'm you know I'm, I'm better than this i don't need to be fixing your damn computer you bitch or something like that whereas i never had to worry about a vet going in there because i knew they could just do the job keep their mouth shut and then they could come into my office and bitch about it afterwards i mean it's that it's that professionalism that they had that or that they have that uh, just it, it really works well within a business, especially if you're in a service part of it where you have customers that, you know, the customers sometimes are having bad days and they need to vent and that, that military guy can just sit there and go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then fix it and then just be the hero as they walked out because they are quiet, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's the one thing I've noticed about them. Uh, yeah. I, especially around the Christmas time, I think I, I talked with a bunch of retailers and, they kind of messed up my orders, things like that. And I, I just talked to them and you would see the retailer get kind of defensive. And I'm like, um, there's like, they, after everything was taken care of, it's like, you know what? I really appreciate it that you didn't go off on me. And like, I'm like, why? <laughs> why? I mean, we're all stressed during the holidays and got this whole pandemic thing. I mean, yeah, we'll get it fixed. I'm like, why? What's, what's the point of bitching at you and yelling at you? It just makes you more stressed. I wish more a lot of people were like that, but it's definitely not that way. No, it's not. People overreact, and then they think that their little tiny problem is the one thing that everybody needs to be focusing on. And oh, think, yeah. Oh, you know what? <clears throat> There's bigger things in this world right now, and, and if you just sit there and you can think about it logically, you'll get it fixed. <laughs> yeah. Nine times out of ten, you'll get it fixed unless you're unless you're dealing with a uh, you know a scammer or something like that, I guess. But yeah. you know, whatever. Usually, it's not Coles or uh, you know, <laughs> Sear, uh, not Sears anymore. But you know, it's not Home Depot that's going to be scamming you. So there's no reason to lose your shit in the customer service line. But yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, well, we're running on an hour. Do you have any last words you want to tell me? Uh, no, it just uh, my book is on uh, Amazon right now um, mm -hmm. for paperback and Kindle. I'm also on Goodreads. Um, if you type in my book, uh, it'll bring you up to my author's page. And you actually could ask me questions there if you have any questions at all. Okay. Okay. And all those links, I I have them up and they'll be included in the show notes. So at the bottom of the, the video or on the uh, podcast, people will be able to click on them there, but all those okay. links will be there and also be on my blog so okay. people can get to them. Um, Eric, I want to thank you for your service and I want to thank you for your time today. I think that there's a lot of good information that came out of this conversation. Um, it was, it was extremely educational for me and, uh, you know, I appreciate whether or not you're going to accept this or not. Um, the heroism that you've shown in not only serving our country, but also dealing with the after effects of it. it it's inspirational. And I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you in my heart. Uh, thank you for having me. And yeah, appreciation is a, uh, is, uh, heartwarming well i appreciate you man with that i'm just going to close by saying this is jeff bacon with the diy writer podcast uh thank you for listening bye-bye please hit the subscribe button i get a bonus for every subscriber and i only need 1506 more to become a full-time paid employee help me please